Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to an evening at the Wheeler Centre that will be all talk. And that's the point. And far from the talk being a reflection of the emptiness of rhetoric, it will hopefully conduce to a reflation in the currency of the spoken word. Uh, Sally Warhaft, on my right, is uh, normally in this position at the Wheeler Centre, helming proceedings and firing questions. But uh, a new edition of her compilation, Well May We Say, The Speeches That Made Australia, offers an opportunity to review uh, almost two centuries of Australians addressing their countrymen and women. You'll hear tonight nine epoch-making speeches, not perhaps the greatest in terms of their erudition and eloquence, but certainly amongst the most influential. And here to deliver these speeches anew are two performers, to whom words are also the staff of life. Uh, you might have seen Zara Newman uh, earlier this year saving the day in the government inspector, uh, Bert Labonte a few years ago inhabiting Nat King Cole in uh, When I Fall in Love, uh, if not, uh, you missed out, but you'll love them tonight. We're enormously grateful to have two such vibrant stage presences to lift these words from the page to the stage this evening. And to help us con contextualise and analyse the words, we have Sally, um, familiar, as I said, to all Wheeler Centre habitues, and Professor Stuart McIntyre, former Dean of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne, a historian so even-handed that he is the <laughs> author of a volume of the Oxford History of Australia and co-editor of the two-volume Cambridge History of Australia. To Sally first, why is Australian rhetoric a worthy subject for a people who probably tend to pride themselves a bit on their uh, laconicism and pragmatism? Yeah, we don't... Uh, well, thank you, first of all, Gideon, for your introduction and for doing this. And, yes, it is rather strange to not be asking the questions, but I'll endeavour to answer them. Uh, we, we, we don't think of Australia as a sort of country of grand, formal speeches, like perhaps, say, in the UK or, or America, even. Um, but I think tracing Australia's history through the spoken word is in fact about the most honest way to do it. Um, everybody can talk in a way that not everybody perhaps uh, can write books or or mm. articles and uh, do it do it in other means. And I just felt like it was a book that was really missing a spoken raw. Um, word uh, history of Australia and a lot of people laughed when I said that I was starting out to do this that you know it'll be like a book of empty pages that there are no great speeches in Australia but in fact when I started delving into it, um, it the book is you know 600 odd pages and there are a lot more that I probably would have loved to have included mm. And, uh, in fact, our story, all the important themes in our history and really important moments have been remembered and mm. defined by speech. Mm. Mm. Stuart, in, in the history wars, um, you've written famously of the kind of the background ideological uh, turmoil in the humanities. To what extent does political or intellectual sympathy shape our evaluations of successful speech? Are there... Mm objectively ascertainable principles of inspirational rhetoric that are perhaps less about what is being said than how it's being said? Well, thanks for the easy question. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I suppose the first thing that strikes me is that oratory in Australia comes in all shapes and mm. forms, but it very commonly marks um, politics, mm. elections, statements in Parliament, mm. announcements of policy... And it's often attended by stating a particular point of view mm. on a public question. I think most mm. of the speeches in this book do. And you assess them, I suppose, by their resonance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not just by their immediate effect, but whether they imprint themselves in people's yes. memories, whether people go back to them. So you can think of examples. Uh, Robert Menzies' Forgotten People speech, which was actually a radio broadcast, mm. has been seen as formative of a new era of politics, yes. and, it, and it was. Mm. Um, I suppose my other observation is that clearly um, speeches remain constant, but the circumstances have changed. Mm. Um, um, people, oratory was something that 
attracted keen interest mm. at a time when there were a few other competitors. Yeah. For, uh, yes. I can still recall as a teenager going to the Hawthorne Town Hall to hear Jim Cairns give yes. his speech um, on the eve of the 61 election yes. and the Hawthorne Town Hall was fairly full. Yeah. Um, and people practised oratory. Mm. Um, people took models. Mm. Um, so it's been a sort of a very influential medium even though the forms in which it's yes. been communicated have changed. Mm. So, Sally, you, you argue in this in your introduction uh, for a kind of a, a rhetorical malaise today. Um, is, is the golden age of speech, like many golden ages, always behind us? Well, people say it is, and it's easy to believe it is, and we're certainly not at a high point, are we, particularly in political oratory. I think um, uh, the, the new speeches of politicians in the last ten years that are in this uh, book, um, and we'll talk more about them because they're, they're going to be read out, but uh, uh, they're, they're speeches that were not from great orators. So I'm mm. talking mm. about mm. Julia Gillard's misogynist speech, Kevin Rudd's apology. Neither of these people are ever going to be remembered as great orators. Mm. In fact, they were pretty ordinary most of the time. But each of them... Mm. Um, in very different ways, gave incredibly important speeches in a moment in time. Mm. What we haven't had for a long time, I think, is a Keating. I think he was the last great orator who could do the, 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 the crafted, beautifully written speech, um, often, of course, in collaboration with his speechwriter, Don Watson, um, but also the brilliant off the cuff. Mm. Every time Keating opened his mouth, every time he still opens his mouth, you just lend him your ears. And I think it's... It, it, look, I, I don't think that our times preclude that. In fact, I think there's never been a better time for somebody mm. that can speak, that is able to, to get up there and just be themselves and, and, and talk about an idea mm. and use the English language in a nice, elegant, mm. beautiful, funny, believable way, mm. well, you'd shine, wouldn't you? So yeah. I don't think it has to be over, but I think for a lot of reasons, more of which we'll get into in our mm. discussion tonight, it is more difficult. Um, and it's, mm. yeah, it's certainly not great times, is it? You'd, mm. you'd, you'd, I mean, going to Parliament at the moment, mm. it, it'd be like some sort of nightmare, wouldn't it, if you went for <laughs> oratory? <laughs> Stuart, Stuart, is it possible to argue for speech being something disproportionately integral to Australian history, in that we were kind of wooed mm. and cajoled into nationhood by the orators of federation, and we have a history that, that's absent a defining bloodletting on our own soil? Yes, I think there's something in that. Um, the historian Alan Atkinson mm. has written a three-volume history mm. of the Europeans in Australia where he defines speech as perhaps the most important mm. cultural form. Um, I think that's true, although my other observation would be that the history of Australia is coterminous with speech and print. Mm. Um, and one has advantages over the other, mm. but one influences the other. Mm. I mean, I, I would add to that that Australia is the only nation born under speech. Yes. Without war, without... Where, mm. with, with federation, I'm talking about federation. Yes. Um, where a, 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 an idea was put forward and then sold through speech. What an, e what an excellent cue. Watch, oh. this, watch, <laughs> this, watch this effortless segue. Um, <laughs> Henry Parks's The Crimson Thread of Kinship. It's not so much a nation building as a nation anticipating speech. Uh, Parks had been anticipating a nation since the inception of his parliamentary career in 1854 and through five terms as Premier of New South Wales. But he'd almost abandoned the notion uh, amidst personal financial travails, followed by the collapse of the first attempt at Australian unification, the Federal Council, in 1889. With the Tenterfield oration delivered later that year at the Tenterfield School of Arts, Parks sought to revive the course, and by this speech... At the Federation Conference earlier the following year, one hears a natural-born politician warming to a cause he was born to champion. Zara Newman to read The Crimson Thread of Kinship. The creation of a nation is an event which can never recur. There cannot be two birthdays of national existence. And in this country of Australia, with such ample space, 
with such inviting varieties of soil and climate, with such vast stores in the hidden wealth under the soil, with such unrivaled richness on all hands, and with a people occupying that soil unequaled in all the whole range of the human race in nation-creating properties, what is there that should be impossible to those people? By the closest calculation that I have been able to make, we, including New Zealand, want 200,000 souls to make four millions of a population. If four millions of a population cannot be the basis for national life, then there never will be a national life. Four millions of population, all of British origin, many and many thousands united to the soil by ties of birth, by ties of parentage, by ties of friendship and love, as well as by ties of marriage and ties of children. If they are not capable of making a nation, a united Australasia, why? We are not fit hardly to occupy this bounteous country. But if anyone supposes those are mere flights of imagination, let us come down to the barest possible calculation of facts. A hundred years ago, the continent was occupied by a despairing group of outcast persons of British origin. And that British origin speaks volumes in every step of our calculation. Forty years ago, the colony of Victoria had no existence. I had been an inhabitant of Australia ten years before Victoria was born. I was an inhabitant of Australia and had a seat in a legislature before the colony of Queensland was born. There is, however, no man in Victoria or Queensland who more rejoiced in their prosperous career and in the grand results that followed than I did. These two colonies, the great and splendid, if at all less splendid on our north, are truly daughters of New South Wales. Those colonies sprung, as it were, from our loins. But there is a difference between us and Adam, for they took a rib from each side of us. However, we rejoice in the fortunes of those colonies, and if my friend Mr. Gillies or our friend Mr. Samuel Griffith doubts that we take a pride and feel a becoming glory in the advance of Victoria and Queensland, let me tell them they are greatly mistaken. The mother colony knows too well, of course, I don't include some two or three carpers, whatever they do or say just now. New South Wales knows too well that the prosperity of her two daughters means her own. We know that it is a wise dispensation that these large colonies sprang into existence, and we admired them when they were fighting their own battles and working out their own prosperity independently of New South Wales. But the time has now arrived when we are no longer isolated. The crimson thread of kinship runs through us all. Even the native-born Australians are Britons. As much as the men born within the cities of London and Glasgow, we know the value of their British origin. We know that we represent a race, but time, of course, does not permit me to glance even at its composition. But we know we represent a race for the purposes of settling new colonies, which never had its equal on the face of the earth. We know, too, that conquering wild territory and planting civilized communities therein is a far nobler, a far more immortalizing achievement than conquest by feats of arms. Is there a man living in any part of Australasia who will say that it would be to the advantage of the whole that we should remain disunited with our animosities, our border customs, and all the friction which our border customs tend to produce until the end of time? I do not believe there is a sane man in the whole population of Australasia who will say such a daringly absurd thing. If this is admitted, the question is reduced to very narrow limits, and it follows that at some time or other, we must unite as one great Australian people. Now, what stands in the way of a federated Australia? A common tariff. National life is a broad river of living water. Your fiscal notions, and I'm a free trader, remember, your fiscal notions on one side or the other are as planting a few stones or piling up a sandbank to divert the stream for a little in order to serve some local interest. This question of a common tariff is a mere trifle compared with the great overshadowing question of a living and eternal national existence. Free trade or protection, all must admit, is to a large extent but a device for carrying out a human notion. 
but there is no human notion at all about the eternal life of a free nation. I say then that what I understand by the sentiment of a united Australasia is a sinking of all subordinate questions. These smaller questions ought not to be considered at the present time, and they ought not to deter us from reaching the great consummation which we have in view. But supposing there should be a united Australia, what would be the benefit to us? Well, with one leap we should appear before the world as a nation. We should grow at once, in a day, as it were, from a group of disunited communities into one solid, powerful, rich and widely respected power. Believing then, as I do, that every man in these colonies would be better off by this union and that no injury could result to any honest interest in consequence, I am altogether in favor of no time being lost in carrying out the sublime object. We are here a great people united by natural ties and with all the capacities that civilized communities can possess. We are as capable of managing our own affairs as our countrymen in any other part of the empire. We are in a fruitful land separated by the will of providence from the rest of the world. What has been difficult in other parts of the world ought not to be difficult with us. And the only obstacles that stand in the way of a united Australasia are those which arise from our own unfortunate separation. Every conceivable difficulty is based upon the separation which we all deplore. Well, these are difficulties which it is to the benefit of all to get rid of. Remember, gentlemen, that no work worthy of achievement was ever attained without surmounting difficulties. Gentlemen, I have tried to express my individual sentiments on this question. I shall endeavor in friendly agreement with my colleagues to do my best towards the same end. I wish to make it known to the world that so long as I have power, I shall not cease to strive to bring about this glorious consummation. In the uh, audience at the Queen's Hall that night, as the Victorian delegate to the Federation Conference, was our second speechmaker. Victorian delegate Alfred Deakin was to be our, uh, our Attorney General when the Federal Vision yielded its first administration and to lay out one of its fundamental precepts that Australia would be a white nation. Introducing the Immigration Restriction Bill to Parliament in Melbourne, Deakin explained its purpose as being to place certain restrictions on immigration and for the removal of prohibited immigrants and why, as Bert Labonte will tell us now. At this early period of our history, we find ourselves confronted with difficulties which have not been occasioned by union, but to deal with which this union was established. We have power to deal with people of any and every race within our borders, except the Aboriginal inhabitants of the continent, who remain under the custody of the states. There is that single exception of a dying race, and if they be a dying race, let us hope that in their last hours they will be able to recognise not simply the justice, but the generosity of the treatment with which the white race who are dispossessing them and are entering into their heritage are recording them. In regard to the people of every other race within our midst, we have special power to legislate. We have power over emigration and immigration, of which this measure proposes to take advantage. We have the power of dealing with the influx of criminals without restriction of race or colour. So we enter on the consideration of this great matter fully equipped in our constitution. The responsibility of dealing with it rests directly on our shoulders. It is that burden we are now endeavouring to lift. We inherit a legacy in the shape of the aliens which have been already admitted within our borders. The program of a white Australia means not merely its preservation for the future, it means the consideration of those who cannot be classed within the category of whites, but who have found their way into our midst. I should say there are about 80,000 coloured aliens in Australia. Of these, probably somewhat less than one half are Chinese, and apparently about 9,000 are Polynesians. The remainder are recruited from a variety of people, mainly those of the neighbouring countries of Asia. 
we find on our hands that uh, this not inconsiderable number of aliens who have found admission to these states, either before there was the protection, such as several of the states now enjoy, or who are still able to find their way into states which, like Victoria, are unhappily not protected to the same degree. It has to be remembered in connection with, with this question that so long as any of the states of the Union remain without their doors closed as much as the other states, the protection which those other states enjoy is absolutely defeated and rendered of no effect. From the states which have no restrictions, immigration is sure to flow and is flowing overland into those which have certain restrictions. What we have to face, therefore, is not an Australia protected to the full extent of state powers, but an Australia which, being only in part protected, is scarcely protected at all, excepting in regard to the Chinese. Even in regard to these, there are considerable differences between the restrictions imposed in the various states. One can well understand the attitude of the statesmen of Europe, absorbed in their own affairs and in the control of large populations within comparatively narrow areas, approaching amazement when they regard what appears to be the arrogance of a handful of white men, most of them clustered on the eastern littoral of this immense continent, adopted before they have effectively occupied a quarter of the continent, and with the great bulk of its immense extent little more than explored, or with a sparse settlement. Those European statesmen may well view with surprise the anxiety exhibited here in this respect. There are those who mock at the demand of a white Australia and who point to what they consider our boundless opportunities for absorbing a far greater population than we at present possess, who dwell, if commercially minded, on the opportunities for business we are neglecting by failing to import the cheapest labour to develop portions of our continent which have not yet has been put to use. But the apprehensions of those abroad, even when cursorily examined, are soon seen to proceed from a far narrower outlook than that which belongs to those who feel themselves charged with the future of this country. Cost, it, cost what it may, we are compelled at the very earliest hour of our national existence, at the very first opportunity when united action becomes possible, to make it positively clear that as far as in us lies, however limited we may be for a time by self-imposed restrictions upon settlement, however much we may sacrifice in the way of immediate monetary gain, however much we may retard the development of the remote and tropical portions of our territory, those sacrifices for the future of Australia are little and are indeed nothing when compared with compensating freedom from the trials, sufferings and losses that nearly wrecked the great republic of the West, still left with the heritage in their midst of a population which, no matter how splendid it may be in many quantities, is not being assimilated and apparently is never to be assimilated in the nation of which they are politically and nominally a part. It is we and not our critics who in this matter are adopting the broader and more serious view, the view which the future will approve. The unity of Australia is nothing if it does not imply a united race. A united race means not only that its members can intermix, intermarry and associate without degradation on either side, but implies one inspired by the same ideas and an aspiration towards the same ideals of a people possessing the same general cast of character, tone of thought, the same constitutional training and traditions, a people qualified to live under this constitution, the broad set, the most liberal perhaps the world has yet seen to reduce to a writing. A people qualified to use without abusing it and to develop themselves under it to the full height and extent of their capacity. Unity of race is an absolute essential to the unity of Australia. It is more, actually, more in the last resort than any other unity. If we include all coloured peoples, we go a long way towards obtaining a... If we exclude, excuse me, if we exclude all coloured peoples, we go a long way to obtaining a white Australia. While the educational standard may exclude a great many, it will not exclude all of these, as there are races whom it is desired to exclude who are quite capable of fulfilling all the conditions imposed in the bill. 
I shall not take advantage of the objection that the persons who annoy us most, the Syrians and the Afghans, who seek to make a living, who seek to make a living by peddling uh, the Polynesians, from whom there is little danger once the state legislation has been dealt with, and 90% of the Chinese who come here would fail to pass the test imposed by the bill. The Chinese and Japanese who arrive uh, belong to poorly paid classes and are the least educated and the least informed of their countrymen. It is not the highly cultured who come here. The number of such people who come here in any one year could be counted upon the fingers of both hands. When it becomes necessary for us to exclude people like the Japanese, it is reasonable that we should exclude them in the most considerate manner possible. <laughs> and without conveying any idea that we have confused them with the many uneducated races of Asia and untutored savages who visit our shores. Considerations of simple politeness, such as honourable members extend to each other in the House, should at least govern the actions of civilised nations in their dealings with one another. I say that the Japanese require to be absolutely excluded. I contend that the Japanese require to be excluded because of their high abilities. I quite agree with the honourable member for Morton that the Japanese are the most dangerous because they most nearly approach us and would, therefore, be our most formidable competitors. It is not that the bad qualities it is not the bad qualities, but the good qualities of these alien races that make them dangerous to us. It is their inexhaustible energy, their power of applying themselves to new tasks, their endurance and low standard of living that make them such competitors. The effect of the contact of these two peoples, such as our own and those constituting the alien races, is not to lift them up to our standard, but to drag our labouring population down to theirs. It is the business qualities, the business aptitude and general capacity of these people that make them dangerous and the fact that while they remain an element in our population, they are incapable of being assimilated makes them all the more to be feared. I have freely expressed all that I think upon this matter but have said it without being personal. <laughs> that is the whole position. The difficulties with which we are confronted are not difficulties of our own creation. Charges have been levelled against the government measure and tirades and torrents of meaningless epithets have been employed. No one welcomes more than the government the frankness and freedom of speech which have been properly used in the House in regard to this great issue. There will be no mistake as to our meaning when the speeches are read and when our votes are seen. Members on both sides of the House and all and of all sections of all parties, those in office and those out of office, with the people behind them, are all united in the unalterable resolve that the Commonwealth of Australia shall mean a white Australia, and that from now henceforward all alien elements within it shall be diminished. We are united in the resolve that this Commonwealth shall be established on the firm foundation of a unity of race, so as to enable it to fulfil the promise of its founders and enjoy to the fullest extent the Charter of Liberty under the crown which we now cherish. <laughs> Stuart, it's a curious mishmash, isn't it, of supremacism and, and inferiority at work in that speech of Deacon's. It's not the bad qualities, but the good qualities of these alien races that make them so dangerous to us. Mm -hmm. What does it tell us about Australian pride and fear at that time? Well, it's a deeply repugnant speech. Mm. We have difficulty, I think, in thinking ourselves back into the assumptions in which he's operating. One thing I should perhaps explain is that he keeps emphasising that um, the immigration restriction is to be exercised by a dictation system in mm. any European language. Other parliamentarians, including the Labor Party, wanted an explicit ban mm. on any non-white race. The reason why the government did it indirectly was to avoid difficulties with the British government mm. because it would have precluded the admission of people who were subjects of the Crown. Mm. But what is he doing? Um, he's, he's trying to argue... I mean, the spectre that he referred to in the speech was the spectre of racial conflict in the United mm. States, mm. Mm. Um, which for he and his contemporaries was alarming. Um, 
he's, he's trying to argue that racial purity makes possible a, a, a united people who can enjoy a greater freedom mm. and greater unity than divisions that will occur with race. Mm. And then, of course, he tangles himself into knots because Japan had recently signed a um, defence treaty mm. with the United Kingdom and he has to justify why the Japanese mm. won't be allowed. Well, they won't be allowed, he says, not because um, they're our inferiors but because mm. they're close to our equals. Mm. Mm. So you can see there that there's a sort of a notion of um, stages of civilization mm. that he ascribes to race but when evidence contradicts it, then race comes first. Mm. It's interesting that the comparison that Deacon draws with the US, Sally. He, co he, he speaks of them as our cousins across the Atlantic. He's addressing Australians, as it were, from Britain. Um, can you kind of explain what seems to us this sort of hybrid identity of independent Australian Britain, which, which Deacon professed? Uh, I probably can't, Gideon. It's a very complex sort of question, isn't it, that identity? Mm. I mean, obviously, all of the... Uh, Henry Parks, Alfred Deacon, all that we've just heard came at a time and for many decades afterwards where the attachment was completely mm. with the motherland, with, mm. with England, and so people looked to the United States, even from here, as mm. you say, as that we were more English mm. uh, still than Australian, that... Uh, um, I mean, the, the Alfred Deakin speech was given in 1901, so the same year as Federation. So, yeah, I think it, I think it was a, a sort of mystical sort of looking across mm. the shores towards America. The thing that strikes me hearing both of these two speeches, I've never heard either of them read out loud, mm. is that one of them, Parks, of course, that mission was so successful. You know, they did create a nation for mm. a continent and um, isn't that great, you know? <laughs> isn't that... What a fantastic achievement. Mm. Um, that could not happen today. Mm. Like, can you imagine, you know, anybody agreeing mm. on anything mm. important <laughs> today, let alone something as, in some ways, difficult to... You know, it would have seemed so sort of esoteric in a way. Or, mm. or why was it important? How do you persuade people that that is is the most important thing. You, you, I can't imagine something like that being able to be done today. Although, although interestingly, I think that they, um, that they don't, that they make quite good parallels with the speeches that we're about to hear. I mean, we have an abiding consciousness of the vulnerabilities of our vast but very thinly populated landmass, and we react very strongly to perceived threats from within and without. Well, that's the difference mm. with, with the Deacon, is that the, the Deacon's White Australia speech, well, clearly didn't work, mm. did it? Just look at this room. Uh, <laughs> but that conversation goes on. Mm. That's not one that's been yes, that's dealt true. with. There is, a, there is a reference in Parks' speech, of course, to colonists who have civilised these wild territories. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, Parks' notion of of nationhood is mm. based on con consanguinity and race just as much as Deacon's. Mm. And of course the other thing we notice in both of them is that of course it's gentlemen. Mm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, our next two speeches, although they sort of post-date the disillusion of white Australia, they, they unsubtly hark back to the fears that it expressed. Pauline Hanson was a first-term non-entity when she delivered her maiden speech in 1996. And John Howard was Australian Prime Minister when he made his election campaign speech in 2001. But as rallying cries, they struck similar notes and lingered long in the memory. Zara, to, bring us, to begin us with the perils of Pauline, and Bert to follow with the gospel, according to John. <laughs> Mr Acting Speaker, in making my first speech in this place, I congratulate you on your election and wish to say how proud I am to be here as the independent member for Oxley. I come here not as a polished politician, but as a woman who has had her fair share of life's knocks. My view on issues is based on common sense and my experience as a mother of four children, as a sole parent, and as a businesswoman running a fish and chip shop. I won the seat of Oxley largely on an issue that has resulted in me being called a racist. That issue related to my comment that Aboriginals received more benefits than non-Aboriginals. We now have a situation where a type of reverse racism is applied to mainstream Australians by those who promote political correctness 
and those who control the various taxpayer-funded industries that flourish in our society, servicing Aboriginals, multiculturalists, and a host of other minority groups. In response to my call for equality for all Australians, the most noisy criticism came from the fat cats, bureaucrats, and the do-gooders. They scream the loudest because they stand to lose the most. Their power, money, and position, all funded by ordinary Australian taxpayers. Present governments are encouraging separatism in Australia by providing opportunities, land, monies, and facilities available only to Aboriginals. Along with millions of Australians, I am fed up to the back teeth with the inequalities that are being promoted by the government and paid for by the taxpayer under the assumption that Aboriginals are the most disadvantaged people in Australia. I do not believe that the color of one's skin determines whether you are disadvantaged. This nation is being divided into black and white, and the present system encourages this. I am fed up with being told, this is our land. Well, where the hell do I go? I was born here, and so were my parents and children. I will work beside anyone, and they will be my equal, but I draw the line when told I must pay and continue paying for something that happened over 200 years ago. Like most Australians, I worked for my land. No one gave it to me. If politicians continue to promote separatism in Australia, they should not continue to hold their seats in this parliament. They are not truly representing all Australians, and I call on the people to throw them out. To survive in peace and harmony, united and strong, we must have one people, one nation, one flag. Immigration and multiculturalism are issues that this government is trying to address, but for far too long, ordinary Australians have been kept out of any debate by the major parties. I, and most Australians, want our immigration policy radically reviewed and that of multiculturalism abolished. I believe we are in danger of being swamped by Asians. Between 1984 and 1995, 40% of all migrants coming into this country were of Asian origin. They have their own culture and religion, form ghettos, and do not assimilate. Of course, I will be called a racist, but if I can invite whom I want into my home, then I should have the right to have a say in who comes into my country. A truly multicultural country can never be strong or united. Abolishing the policy of multiculturalism will save billions of dollars and allow those from ethnic backgrounds to join mainstream Australia, paving the way to a strong, united country. Immigration must be halted in the short term so that our dull cues are not added to by, in many cases, unskilled migrants not fluent in the English language. This would be one positive step to rescue many young and older Australians from a predicament which has become a national disgrace and crisis. Wake up, Australia before it is too late. Australians need and want leaders who can inspire and give hope in difficult times. Now is the time for the Howard government to accept the challenge. And they did. <laughs> <clears throat> we are, as you all know, in a new and dangerous part of the world's history. The tragic events of the 11th of September have changed our lives. They have caused us to take pause and think about the values we hold in common with the American people and free people around the world. That was an attack on Australia as much as it was an attack on the United States. It not only claimed the lives of Australians, but it assaulted the very values that we hold dear and that we take for granted. So therefore, a military response and wise diplomacy and a steady hand on the helm are needed to guide Australia through those very difficult circumstances. National security is therefore about a proper response to the terrorism. It's also about having a far-sighted, strong, well-thought-out defence policy. It is also about having an uncompromising view about the fundamental right of this country to protect its borders. It's about this nation saying to the world, we are a generous, open-hearted people, taking more refugees on, per ca on a per capita basis than any nation except Canada. We have a proud record of welcoming people from 140, 140 different nations, but we will decide who comes to this country 
and the circumstances in which they come. Sally, Pauline Hanson spoke as a woman who has had her fair share of life's knocks and made a virtue of her inarticulacy. It's very obviously a departure from the high-flown rhetoric we heard earlier. Has inspirational rhetoric gone out of fashion? Do we simply want to hear people as mundane, as everyday, and as thick as we are? Mm. <laughs> um, no, I don't think that's... I think people do want to be inspired. I mean, I think the standout line from Pauline Hans's speech is, I consider myself an ordinary Australian. That's mm -hmm. the line I mm -hmm. remember, mm -hmm. and that was her power. And, of course, it was really underestimated by the media mm. and a lot of people what that meant to a certain demographic, which was 9% of the federal mm. vote in that election. Yeah. I mean, it was... She, she went on to, to get 9%. Um, so, I mean, we see it in, in other areas of life, this in newspapers, I suppose, this... We call it dumbing down, don't we? And um, where, where the ordinary, ordinary is kind of... Uh, cool, but I think that people are still absolutely moved and crave inspiration. Um, and uh, I suppose to certain people, Pauline Hanson was inspiring, and we know that because John Howard mm. took it on. He mm. took on her agenda and also succeeded. And now we're seeing it again with, with, with Tony Abbott, you know, stop the boats was the mantra. Mm. So we see echoes in time. In so many areas of Australian speech making, we see these echoes of continuity um, that you know it, ordinariness has never been one mm. of the one of the the big ones. So yeah. let's hope it doesn't doesn't become that. Yeah, Stuart. I mean, John Howard, Australia's second most successful prime minister. Mm -hmm. It's hard to remember him really uttering too many memorable lines in that time, and uh. yet he must have been doing something rhetorically right. What was it? Well, of course, that final phrase was the one that was used in mm. liberal advertisements yeah. the following. I, I mean, I suppose the way I read it is that um, at, at one level he was simply wedging Kim Beasley and Labor. Mm. Um, they were split between mm. thinking we can't afford not to say we're going to protect the borders mm. and causing considerable unhappiness in their support base. If you think back on the context, shortly before um, he gave the speech, there were several unauthorised arrivals. Mm. Uh, the first of them, of course, was the kids overboard affair, yes. which went badly wrong for the government. Mm. So when the tamper came along, mm. having picked up people from a boat and was ordered not to put in, mm. and they were taken off, he had an issue on which he could campaign. Yes. And you've already said, that if you look at the way in which he says in these uncertain times, mm. our alliance with the United States, uh, with the West, um, and with the free world mm. becomes all the more important mm. and clearly plays on the idea of an invasion anxiety. Mm. Um, but does so very succinctly mm. uh, in a, and in a language which is not overtly prejudicial. Yes. Yeah. One of the other things about that speech, I mean, it was part of a policy speech after September 11 going into the 2001 election. And when he said that, it got a lot of immediate coverage. That line, you know, got mm -hmm. a lot of attention straight mm -hmm. away. But it wasn't apparent then, or, or even I think for a couple of years mm -hmm. afterwards, just how much impact that speech, mm -hmm. how much resonance it would it would carry on to have. So that was not in the first edition of this book. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It got into this latest edition because it's really carried. Right. Um, and I, I didn't think at the time... Uh, that it, it was going to have that much mm. endurance. But mm. John Howard, you know, there's a couple of his speeches in this collection. He could... he could. I mean, it, it, a very different kind of speech was his memorial um, speech to the victims of the Bali um, terrorist um, bombings, the nightclub mm -hmm. bombings, and he went over there, I think, in the just the days or so, weeks afterwards, and incredibly moving... Speech. I don't think anybody could have picked mm. the more appropriate or, 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 mm. or moving words. Um, so he he could do it when he needed to, uh, better than uh, some since and many mm. before. In her maiden speech, uh, Pauline Hanson said that she drew the line at continuing to pay for something that happened over 200 years ago. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. But the possibility of this was precisely the warning in our next remarkable speech, given at a public meeting in Guildford in June 1833 by Robert Lyon, a former military officer, linguist and classicist who roved Western Australia in its pioneering days and scolded settlers for their attitude to the Indigenous peoples. This is the oldest of our speeches tonight, and it shows its age in its archaisms, but not in its sentiments and concerns, which one also hears in two other speeches to follow, the attempt by Paul Keating at Redfern Park in 1992 and Kevin Rudd in 2007 to come to terms with Indigenous dispossession. So here's a triptych of speeches, admonition, acknowledgement and apology. But if ye have taken their country from them, and they refuse to acknowledge your title to it, ye are at war with them, and, having never allowed your right to call them British subjects, they are justified by the usages of war in taking your property wherever they find it, and in killing you whenever they have an opportunity. Ye are the aggressors. The law of nations will bear them out in repelling force by force. They did not go to the British Isles to make war upon you, but ye came from the British Isles to make war upon them. Ye are the invaders of their country. Ye destroy the natural productions of the soil on which they live. Ye devour their fish and their game, and ye drive them from the abodes of their ancestors. Think not, then, that the Aboriginal inhabitants of Australia, offspring of the same great parents with yourselves, and partakers of all the kindred feelings of a common humanity can resign the mountains and seas, the rivers and lakes, the plains and the wilds of their uncradled infancy and the habitation of their fathers for generations immemorial to a foreign foe without the bitterness of grief. They may stand to be slaughtered, but they must not throw a spear in their own defense or attempt to bring their enemies to a sense of justice by the only means in their power, that of returning like for like. If they do, if they dare to be guilty of an act which in other nations would be eulogized as the noblest of a patriot's deeds, they are outlawed. A reward is set upon their heads, and they are ordered to be shot, as if they were so many mad dogs. Thus, in the barbarous manner, ye practice in them what ye condemn the law of retaliation. The fate of Cain will be yours. Ye may enjoy the blood-stained spoils of an innocent, unoffending people, but ye cannot bury the crime ye perpetrate in the graves of your victims, nor escape the eyes of him who has drawn the lines of demarcation around the inheritance of every nation. Your fallen countenances will betray you. The voice of your brother's blood will cry from the ground where it is shed. The land of your fathers will abhor you, and the page of history will brand you to the latest posterity with the guilt of the unparalleled deed. Choose for yourselves. If ye determine upon a war of extermination, civilized nations will be mute with astonishment at the madness of a policy so uncalled for, so demoniacal. When your doom is passed, your own children, for whose sakes ye have invaded the country, will join with the disinherited offspring of those ye have slain to pour a flood of curses on your memory. If ye have any feelings of compunction, before the die be cast, let the Aboriginal inhabitants of Australia live. Ye have taken from them all they had on earth. Be content with this, and do not add to the crime of plundering them that of taking their lives. Let them live that they, might, that they may be put in possession of a title to a better country, a country where the invading foe dare not enter. It begins, I think, with that act of recognition, recognition that it was we who did the dispossessing. We took the traditional lands and smashed the traditional way of life. We brought the diseases, the alcohol, we committed the murders, we took the children from their mothers, we practiced discrimination and exclusion, it was our ignorance and our prejudice, and our failure to imagine these things being done to us. With some noble exceptions, we failed to make the most basic human response and enter into their hearts and minds. We failed to ask, how would I feel if this were done to me? As a consequence, 
we failed to see that what we were doing degraded all of us. The message should be that there is nothing to fear or lose in the recognition of historical truth or the extension of social justice or the deepening of Australian social democracy to include Indigenous Australians. There is everything to gain. Even the unhappy past speaks for this. Where Aboriginal Australians have been included in the life of Australia, they have made remarkable contributions, economic contributions, particularly in the pastoral and agricultural industry. They are there in the frontier and exploration history of Australia. They are there in the wars, in sport to an extraordinary degree, in literature and art and music. In all these things, they have shaped our knowledge of this continent and of ourselves. They have shaped our identity. They are there in the Australian legend we should never forget. They have helped build this nation. And if we have a sense of justice as well as common sense, we will forge a new partnership. As I said, it might help us if we non-Aboriginal Australians imagined ourself, ourselves dispossessed of land we had lived on for 50,000 years, and then imagined ourselves told that it had never been ours. Imagine if ours was the oldest culture in the world and we were told that it was worthless. Imagine if we had resisted this settlement, suffered and died in the defence of our land and were told in history books that we'd given up without a fight. Imagine if non-Aboriginal Australians had served this country in peace and war and were then ignored in the history books. Imagine if our feats on sporting fields had inspired admiration and patriotism and yet did nothing to diminish prejudice. Imagine if our spiritual life was denied and ridiculed. Imagine if we had suffered the injustice and then were blamed for it. It seems to me if that we can imagine the injustice, we can imagine its opposite. And we can have justice. I say that for two reasons. I say it because I believe that the great things about Australian social democracy reflect a fundamental belief in justice. And I say it because in so many other areas we have proved our capacity over the years to go on, extending the realms of participation, opportunity and care. I said we non-Indigenous Australians should try to imagine the Aboriginal view. It can't be too hard. Someone imagined this event today and it is now a marvellous reality and a great reason for hope. There is one thing today we cannot imagine. We cannot imagine that the descendants of people whose genius and resilience maintain a culture here through 50,000 years or more, through cataclysmic changes to the climate and environment, and who then survived two centuries of dispossession and abuse will be denied their place in the modern Australian nation. We cannot imagine that. We cannot imagine that we will fail. And with the spirit that is here today, I am confident that we won't. I am confident that we will succeed in this decade. Mr Speaker, I move that today we honour the Indigenous peoples of this land, the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We reflect on their past mistreatment. We reflect in particular on the mistreatment of those who are stolen generations this blemished chapter in our national history. The time has now come for the nation to turn a new page, a new page in Australia's history by righting the wrongs of the past and so moving forward with confidence into the future. We apologize for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these, our fellow Australians. We apologise especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. For the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for their families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters, for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry and for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. We, the Parliament of Australia, respectfully request that this apology be received in the spirit in which it is offered, as part of the healing of the nation. For the future, we take heart 
resolving that this new page in the history of our great continent can now be written. We today take this first step by acknowledging the past and laying claim to a future that embraces all Australians, a future where this parliament resolves that the injustices of the past must never, never happen again. A future where we harness the determination of all Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to close the gap that lies between us in life expectancy, educational achievement and economic opportunity. A future where we embrace the possibility of new solutions to enduring problems, where old approaches have failed. A future based on mutual respect, mutual resolve and mutual responsibility. A future where all Australians, whatever their origins, are truly equal partners with equal opportunities and with an equal stake in shaping the next chapter in the history of this great country, Australia. Mr. Speaker, the nation is demanding of its political leadership to take us forward. Mr. Speaker, decency, human decency, universal human decency demands that the nation now steps forward to right an historical wrong. And that is what we are doing in this place today. We, the parliaments of the nation, are ultimately responsible, not those who gave effect to our laws. The problem lay with the laws themselves. As has been said of settler societies elsewhere, we are the bearers of many blessings from our ancestors, and therefore we must also be the bearer of their burdens as well. Therefore, for our nation, the course of action is clear. Therefore, for our people, the course of action is clear, and that is to deal now with what has become one of the darkest chapters in Australia's history. In doing so, we are doing more than contending with the facts, the evidence, and the often rancorous public debate. In doing so, we are also wrestling with our own soul. It's time to reconcile. It's time to recognize the injustices of the past. It's time to say sorry. It's time to move forward together. To the stolen generations, I say the following. As Prime Minister of, Str of Australia, I am sorry. On behalf of the Government of Australia, I am sorry. On behalf of the Parliament of Australia, I am sorry. And I offer you this apology without qualification. We apologize for the hurt, the pain and suffering we, the Parliament, have caused you by the laws that previous parliaments have enacted. We apologize for the indignity, the degradation and the humiliation these laws embodied. We offer this apology to the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, the sisters, the families and the communities whose lives were ripped apart by the actions of successive governments under successive parliaments. In making this apology, I would also like to speak personally to the members of the Stolen Generation and their families those here today, so many of you, to those listening across the nation, from Uindamu in the central west of the Northern Territory, to Yabara in North Queensland, and to Pichichinjara in South Australia. I know that in offering this apology on behalf of the government and the parliament, there is nothing I can say today that can take away the pain you have suffered personally. Whatever words I speak today, I cannot undo that. Words alone are not that powerful. Grief is a very personal thing. I say to non-Indigenous Australians listening, listening today, those who may not fully understand why what we are doing is so important, I ask those non-Indigenous Australians to imagine for a moment if this had happened to you. I say to honourable members here present, imagine if this had happened to us. Imagine the crippling effect. Imagine how hard it would be to forgive. Stuart, Robert Lyon first. For mm -hmm. all its anachronistic touches, that speech, very powerfully delivered by Zara, kind of leaps out of the past and assails our tender ears. What did it do at the time? And how were Robert Lyon's injunctions and admonitions received? Yeah, I, I'd not in, encountered him before, mm. and Sally's selection made me go, there's no entry for him in the Australian mm. Dictionary of Biography. Mm. In fact, his real name was Robert Milne. Mm. 
He came out here as Robert Menley Lyon. Menley is an acronym of his original name. He came from Scotland. He had been born in Inverness. He'd clearly trained in theology. Mm. You can see mm. the effects of it there, not just the biblical ye, but mm. the reference to the Mosaic law to the scattered tribes mm. of Israel. He gave this speech after he came to Western Australia um, and took up land, but interested himself in a resistance leader, a man called Jagen, who'd mm. been captured. And he persuaded the government to allow him to talk to Jagen and to try to seek a reconciliation. But before he finished that, Jagen escaped and resumed mm. his activity. Um, and he became a very unpopular person. Mm. Um, he essentially had to leave Western Australia mm. because of white... Um, hostility mm. and went to Mauritius, later to South Australia. He was on the gold fields here um, and to my surprise I found he died 40 years later in London and left considerable money. He'd been a businessman. Mm. The way I see him there is a strong notion of a violation of God's will, mm. um, of um, all people having equal rights before God and a strong element, isn't there, of warning of the mm. consequences mm. of violating mm. God's will. It's a very powerful, I'd not encountered it. I mean, mm. Henry Reynolds picked him up mm. but didn't say very yes. much about him. He was clearly a very rackety individual mm. and that presumably began to overshadow. He wanted, for instance, to establish an Aboriginal protectorate in Victoria mm. but was not encouraged mm. to do so. Mm. And I have a suspicion that he's increasingly regarded as a sort of a, a chancer. Mm. So, the, I mean, the scenario in which Keating spoke was a bit similar in that he yeah. addressed an audience mm. which at first kind of bristled with, with hostility. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit about the background to, to that speech? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I just wanted to remind the audience before I do mm. that that the Robert Lyon speech, 1833, mm -hmm. you know, that this has yeah. been going on a long, long time mm. to, to remember there were always voices mm. of protest mm. Um the Keating speech uh, is, of course, you know, one of the, the great contemporary speeches, I think, in Australian history, written, of course, by the gifted Don Watson, who had this, you know, strange kind of almost like a marriage-like relationship, I think, with, um, with Keating. Mm -hmm. The story that day was that um, Keating had to deliver two speeches that day. And I think the, the other one was to the business council or but that was the one that Keating thought was going to be important and I think that that Don Watson and Paul Keating were on an aeroplane mm. that morning heading to Redfern and they kind of brushed over the Redfern speech they were worried about the impact that this second one now forgotten of mm. course would have um there's a couple of interesting things going on with Redfern Park of course it was delivered to a mainly black audience who initially were quite hostile, there were catcalls. So it's a really great example of speech as persuasion, mm. where you know you have to convince a hostile audience that, that this is... And that is what good leaders do, or should do, uh, that it's not about the easy sell. And in some ways, too, it's why I also mm. think Keating... Um, was the last of a certain group. Mm. Menzies could do this. Billy Hughes could do it. Um, but I mm. think that Keating was the last, mm. where a, an idea in front of a hostile audience, but you will still stand up and say it. And as the speech went on, gradually over time, mm. the cat calls changed to silence and then to sort of assent murmurs of mm. agreement and mm. cheers. and. You know, this is speech at its greatest, I think, when you can actually turn mm. the crowd around. Mm. And, um, you know, really, it doesn't matter how many times you hear those words. I th it begins, I think, mm. with that act of recognition. Mm. It just it makes you, you know, mm. moves you, doesn't mm. it? It seems to me that Rudd's apology now expresses both the power and the ineffectuality of mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. It was meant to signal a major departure yep. in Indigenous relations, but the problems that he discusses have remained intractable. What are we to make of it now? I, 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 when it was delivered, I was in uh, Boston, mm. and of course it was front page news in the New York Times, mm. and all of the Australian postgraduate students at Harvard were watching it online. Um, I, so I wasn't here to sort of mm. share in it. 
Uh, it, looking at it, there are a couple of things that strike me. Um, there were not only thousands of Aboriginal people who went to Canberra mm. to hear it being delivered, but it was broadcast live in remote yes. Aboriginal communities. And looking back, there's an irony. Those remote Aboriginal communities had been the subject of intervention. Yes. Their powers of self-determination had been qualified. Uh, new methods of management had been introduced, which, with retrospect, we see have produced at best mixed results. Mm. And Rudd, rather like Keating, um, wants to say this is a new page, mm. a new chapter. Mm. Um, I don't think Paul Keating ever would have talked about moving forward the way Kevin Rudd does. Together. It's a mixture of sort of public policy ease mm. and strongly felt emotions and yes. intentions that, um, for me, don't wear well. Yes. It was a really high point for Rudd. I, I, mm. was, I was actually walking up Gertrude Street in Fitzroy with a listening live on the radio mm -hmm. um, by accident. And, of course, Gertrude Street in Fitzroy is where... There's been a lot of Aboriginal services over the years and mm -hmm. housing and legal services and so on. And, um, I mean, I was really moved by it. It's, it, it. it's one of those speeches that repays reading in a way because mm -hmm. you do get a different... Um, but, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that Rudd just wishes he could have lived in that moment forever. <laughs> it was a it's interesting that you both referred to, um, to, to television and, 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 to, and to radio and, and, to, and to the medium involved in, in hearing the speeches because the last two that we're going to hear this evening bring us very much into the modern era. Uh, the attack on Tony Abbott by Julia Gillard not quite two years ago and David Morrison's, uh, the Chief of the Army's fierce scrutiny of sexism in the military, which was delivered only last year. And they went, as they say, viral. Um, Julia Gillard's misogyny speech has its own Wikipedia page, I found the other day. Uh, David Morrison's speech has 1.5 million hits on YouTube and 15,000 thumbs up. Well, uh, we'll pull the old switcheroo here. Um, Bert will be delivering, will be channeling Julia Gillard. And Zara will be um, uh, doing David Morrison. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And I rise to oppose the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition. And in so doing, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I will not. And the Government will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. Not now, not ever. The Leader of the Opposition says that people who hold sexist views and who are misogynist are not appropriate for high office. Well, I hope the Leader of the Opposition has got a piece of paper and he's writing out his resignation. Because if he wants to know what misogyny looks like in modern Australia, he doesn't need a motion in the House of Representatives. He needs a mirror. That's what he needs. Let's go through the Opposition Leader's repulsive double standards, repulsive double standards when it comes to misogyny and sexism. We are now supposed to take seriously that the Leader of the Opposition is offended by Mr Slipper's text messages. When this is the Leader of the Opposition who said, and this is when he was a minister under the last government, not when he was a student, not when he was in high school, when he was a minister under the last government. He has said, and I quote, in a discussion about women being underrepresented in institutions of power in Australia, the interviewer was a man called Stavros. The leader of the opposition says, if it's true, Stavros, that men have more power, generally speaking, than women, is that a bad thing? And then a discussion ensues and another person being interviewed says, I want my daughter to have as much opportunity as my son, to which the leader of the opposition says, yeah, I completely agree. But what if men are, physiolog phys physiology or what if men are by physiology or temperament more adapted to exercise authority or to issue command? Then ensues another discussion about women's roles in modern society. And the other person participating in the discussion says, I think it's very hard to deny that there is an underrepresentation of women, to which the leader of the opposition says, but now there's an assumption that this is a bad thing. <laughs> this is from the man whom we're supposed to take lectures about sexism. And then, of course, it goes on. I was very offended personally when the leader of the opposition, as Minister for Health, said, and I quote, abortion is the easy way out. I was very personally offended by those comments. You said that in March 2004. I suggest you check your records. I was also very offended on behalf of the women of Australia when in the course of this carbon pricing campaign, the leader of the opposition said, what the housewives of Australia need to do, what the housewives of Australia need to understand as they do the ironing, 
Thank you for that painting of women's roles in modern Australia. And then, of course, I was offended by the sexism, by misogyny, by two, by the sexism, by the misogyny of the leader of the opposition, cat calling across the table at me as I sit here as Prime Minister. If the Prime Minister wants to, politically speaking, make an honest woman of herself, something that never would have been said to any man sitting in this chair. I was offended when the leader of the opposition went outside in the front of parliament and stood next to a sign that said, Ditch the Witch. I was offended when the leader of the opposition stood next to a sign that described me as a man's bitch. I was offended by those things. Misogyny, sexism. Every day from this leader of the opposition. Every day, in every way, across the time the leader of the opposition has sat in that chair and I've sat in this chair. That is all we have heard from him. And now the leader of the opposition wants to be taken seriously. Apparently he's woken up after his track record and all of these statements. He's woken up and he's gone, oh dear, there's this thing called sexism. Oh my Lord, there's this thing called misogyny. Now who's one of them? Oh, the speaker must be because that suits my political purpose. Doesn't turn a hair about any of his past statements, doesn't walk into this parliament and apologise to the women of Australia, doesn't walk into this parliament and apologise to me for the things that have come out of his mouth, but now seeks to use this as a battering ram against someone else. Well, this kind of hypocrisy should not be tolerated, which is why this motion from the Leader of the Opposition should not be taken seriously. And then second, the Leader of the Opposition is always wonderful about walking into this parliament and giving me and others a lecture about what they should take responsibility for. Always wonderful about that. Everything that I should take responsibility for, now apparently including the text messages from the member for Fisher, always keen to say others should assume responsibility, particularly me. Well, can anybody remind me if the Leader of the Opposition has taken any responsibility for the conduct of the Sydney Young Liberals and the attendance at this event of members of his front bench? He has, taken, has he taken any responsibility for the conduct of members of his political party and the members of his front bench, who apparently, when the most vile things were being said about my family, raised no voice of objection? No one walked out of the room. No one walked up to Mr Jones and said that this was not acceptable. Instead, of course, it was all viewed as good fun until it was run in a Sunday newspaper and then the Leader of the Opposition and others started ducking for cover. Big on lectures of responsibility, very light on accepting responsibility himself for the vile conduct of the members of his political party. Then of course, then of course, the leader of the opposition comes into this place and says, and I quote, and says, and I quote, every day the Prime Minister stands in this parliament to defend this speaker will be another day of shame for this parliament. Another day of shame for a government which is already which should have already died of shame. Well, can I indicate to the Leader of the Opposition, the government is not dying of shame. My father did not die of shame. What the Leader of the Opposition should be ashamed of is his performance in this parliament and the sexism he brings with it. I will not ever see the Leader of the, of the Opposition seek to impose his double standard on this parliament. Sexism should always be unacceptable. We should conduct ourselves as it should always be unacceptable. The Leader of the Opposition says, do something. Well, he could do something himself if he wants to deal with sexism in this parliament. He could change his behaviour. He could apologise for all his past statements. He could apologise for standing next to signs describing me as a witch and a bitch, terminology that is now objected to by the front bench, front bench of the opposition. He could change a standard himself if he sought to do so. But we will see none of that from the leader of the opposition because on these questions, he is incapable of change capable of double standards, but incapable of change. His double standards should not rule this parliament. Good sense, common sense, proper process is what, sh is what should rule this parliament. That's what I believe is the path forward for this parliament, not the kind of double standards and political game playing imposed by the leader of the opposition. Now, now looking at his watch, because apparently a woman's spoken too long, I've had him yell at me to shut up in the past, but I will take the remaining seconds of my speaking time to say to the Leader of the Opposition, I think the best course for him is to reflect on the standards he's exhibited in public life, on the responsibility he should take for his public statements, on his close personal connection with Peter Slipper, on the hypocrisy he has displayed in this House today. And on that basis, because of the Leader of the Opposition's motivations, this Parliament 
today should reject this motion and the Leader of the Opposition should think seriously about the role of women in public life and in Australian society because we are entitled to a better standard than this. Earlier today, I addressed the media and through them the Australian public about ongoing investigations into a group of officers and NCOs whose conduct, if proven, has not only brought the Australian Army into disrepute, but has let down every one of you and all those whose past service has won the respect of our nation. There are limits to how much I can tell you because the investigations into this network by both the New South Wales Police and the ADF Investigative Service are ongoing. But evidence collected to date has identified a group of men within our ranks who have allegedly produced highly inappropriate material demeaning women and distributed it across the internet and defence's email networks. If this is true, then the actions of these members are in direct contravention to every value, in the, every value the Australian Army stands for. By now, I assume you know my attitude to this type of conduct. I have stated categorically many times that the Army has to be an inclusive organisation in which every soldier, man and woman, is able to reach their full potential and is encouraged to do so. Those who think that it is okay to behave in a way that demeans or exploits their colleagues have no place in this Army. Our service has been engaged in continuous operations since 1999 and in its longest war ever in Afghanistan. On all operations, female officers and soldiers have proven themselves worthy of the best traditions of the Australian Army. They are vital to us maintaining our capability now and into the future. If that does not suit you, then get out. You may find another employer where your attitude and behaviour is acceptable, but I doubt it. The same goes for those who think that toughness is built on humiliating others. Every one of us is responsible for the culture and reputation of our army and the environment in which we work. If you become aware of any individual degrading another, then show moral courage and take a stand against it. No one has ever explained to me how the exploitation or degradation of others enhances capability or honours the traditions of the Australian Army. I will be ruthless in ridding the army of people who cannot live up to its values and I need every one of you to support me in achieving this. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. That goes for all of us, but especially those who by their rank have a leadership role. If we are a great national institution, if we care about the legacy left to us by those who have served before us, if we care about the legacy we leave to those who in turn will protect and secure Australia, then it is up to us to make a difference if you're not up for it, find something else to do with your life. There is no place for you amongst this band of brothers and sisters. I found the, the listening to the Julia Gillard speech extremely interesting. It's, um, it's one of those speeches that seems to require being read aloud to really, to really resonate. On the page, it sits a little bit limply. I mean, I remember... Not the on the, my pages. No, of course. Of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, I mean, like a lot of people at the time, I found it very, very compelling and, um, you know, in its boldness, in its extemporaneous character, in the fact that the theatre in which it was delivered, you know, across the, the, um, the house from the, the grinning homunculi of the, of the opposition front bench... <laughs> But when I read it for the first time, and actually it is the first time I've read it all the way through at the weekend, I found it a bit thin, considering that a lot of it is about defending Peter Slipper, mm -hmm. <laughs> of all people, and the cynicism of, of making him a speaker. Sally, what do you think? Is, is the way that it looms in the public mind about what Gillard said or about what people wished she'd said? I think this is one of the many reasons, Gideon, why it repays quiet reading, mm. actually, because... This speech is so, I, uh, more than any other speech, I think, in the last hundred mm. years at least, is so caught up in, it's so fraught with mm. so many things. And we saw the great divide was between the media's interpretation, who saw it, in fact, 
the, of the technicalities mm. of what it mm. was, which was about Peter Slipper, which was about yes. um, the, the context of the day. Mm. And in that sense, they totally read it correctly. That's their job, mm. is to talk about the context of the politi- politics. What they mm. missed was the broader reach mm. a, a, and a, an incredible reach that it had, that this was um, a speech that touched women especially, mm. I think. Mm. And, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really complicated one because when she's not defending a, a Slipper, she's, um, it, it's, a, it's a speech in defence of herself. And mm. it's one of the things that makes it really powerful. This is a woman mm. standing up finally, incredibly brilliantly in terms of, you know, she, she, there was no preparation for this. A minder passed her a few notes. Mm. It's off the cuff. And the power of the of the expression and the delivery, which is it shows you how much delivery matters, mm. um, was extraordinary. Whereas in contrast, Dave Morrison is defending his people. Mm. It's why I always mm. felt with the misogyny speech, I always felt really frustrated that she didn't give it in a domestic violence shelter. You know, <laughs> I just would have mm. I, I, that speech would have meant a hundred times more to me mm. if it had been about other women under her charge as the leader. Um, Having said that, I also understand Mm. its resonance, whereas David Morrison is defending the people Mm. under his charge. And really interestingly, David Morrison's speech was written by his speechwriter, Kate McGregor, who um, some of you may remember from an Australian story about her. Kate uh, is... Uh, was formerly a, a male. She's transgender. So she was the person of the highest rank to ever go through this process, um, you know, in such high office. She's got an order of Australia for bravery and mm. combat and war. Um, and so she she is somebody who so deeply understands, um, you know, uh, these kind of identity mm. questions, I guess. Mm. And it, it just, I think, adds to its poignancy. I, I, I hear the Morrison speech and I, I just tingle mm. in, in a way well, that I don't actually hearing uh, the misogyny one. Well, interestingly, I mean, I watched David Morrison um, on YouTube again mm. at the weekend and there's, there's, a, there's actually a little bit of a contrast between the words on the page, good as they are, yep. and Morrison's seething, mm. unfaltering mm. delivery his eyes virtually burn a hole in the camera if you if you've seen it, and he bares his teeth well, every so often, the, almost in this snarl. It feels it actually feels like he's addressing only you. The other thing that's amazing about this speech, the Morrison speech, it's the first ever speech in this collection mm. and from any high institutional office, certainly, mm. that was written and delivered specifically yes. for YouTube, yes. which makes it singular. Uh, and this is yeah. going to be the start of a new way yeah. of speechifying. Okay, but well, what's, the, what's, um, the impact, what's the impact of that technology that can bring a speaker directly yeah. into your home and give you this kind of almost a one-on-one relationship with the, uh, with the address or... And that you can control the mm, presentation yeah. more clearly. I mean, the thing that strikes me about both of them are that both are the products of accumulated rage. Mm. Both are marked by a particular sort of anger, aren't they? Yes. And you say that she only had a few notes. It's clear the notes she had because she was expecting a motion of censure, mm. where the quotations of, with Stavros and other, yes. other follies by Abbott, they're the weakest part of the speech. Yes. The strongest part of the speech is where she abandons a stilted delivery yes. that too often she gave yes. and simply lets him have it. Yes. And I think it's compelling in that. And the thing that strikes me, I suppose, about the Morrison one, it's an extraordinarily powerful speech. It sort of, it bears the hallmarks, doesn't it? We now have armed forces who are recasting themselves as peacekeepers and are inclusive, who want to affirm their traditions. He's had to deal with persistent resistance Mm. from other Mm. officers. Mm. He's had enough of it. It's carefully presented to him by yes. his speechwriter, but he makes it his own. Yes. Uh, and it is, it is fully authentic. There's no suggestion he's reading words. No. Um, he feels them. Mm. Mm. I think both of them are very powerful speeches for that reason. I suppose many of us would hope that Julia Gillard lost her temper more frequently. <laughs> well, you do. You wish, you wish that more people would. But the other thing, too, that we, we talk about YouTube and yeah. new ways, every time mm. that technology changes... 
So whether it's the introduction of the microphone, you no longer needed a booming voice, yes. or the introduction with Whitlam in 1972, it's time with television, completely changed everything. Image became as important as the, the spoken mm. word. And that now with the internet, and you've got the chief of the army, you know, making such an important speech. But the other side of that, I think, is that a lot of this technology, like everybody's got a phone in their pocket, they can mm -hmm. record. Mm. No public figure now can give a mm. speech mm. anywhere without assuming that it's being recorded mm. and that it'll be on YouTube whether yes. or not they're controlling it. And I think that's possibly part of the fear of people mm. speaking yeah. their mind. It's a fear they should just let go of. Yes. They might even be talking to a former mayor of New York. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But, I mean, I, I, I agree with you about that potential, but we just said before that the power of Paul Keating's um, mm. Redfern speech mm. is the audience. Yes. Mm. And much yes. of the power of Julia Gillard's misogyny speech is Tony Abbott sitting across the dispatch mm. box. Mm. Mm. Slumping mm. in his seat as so, so, goes along. Uh, uh, yeah. It's interesting hearing that quip from, from Julia Gillard about, um, about looking at Abbott looking at his at his watch. Yes. Uh, in thinking about the speeches that we heard tonight um, and how they might lead to an understanding of Australian rhetoric, I could tick the boxes of uh, passion, pathos, fluency, directness, but there was something I found that lacking in all the speeches, and in fact maybe lacking overall in the book, is humour. I mean, oh. in your book, I think there's only one book that's in one speech that's really laugh out loud funny, and that's Daniel Dennehy's. Uh, the Bunyip Aristocracy. Mm. Oh, I know. I think uh, Far Lap. There's a great hysterical speech. But would you think? Would you Lap. think that we're a country? We, we, we're a country that takes a bit of pride in our sense of humour. Where have been our funny speakers? Um, w they're lacking. I think mm. that is true. Although there's more than one mm. uh, in the book, uh, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I it's might a big be book. might be delivering a rather funny one at the end of this session, actually, myself. Uh, it's um, uh, but we've been great at humorists and satirists in mm. in Australia, but mm. they haven't tended to, I suppose, give speeches that are you know that have that have kind of shaped us in a way. Mm. Although the ones that you talk about, the Bunyip aristocracy, um, which. You know, you think about a speech like that being mm. given today yeah. where yeah. a young guy, 24 years old, mm. in, you know, the 1800s, stands up in a town hall, takes on the most powerful politician mm. of his generation, William Wentworth, and contributes to Australia not having uh, inherited Senate like the House of Lords uh, and gets up and mocks these politicians, mocks it into oblivion. Mm. Not him alone, a lot of mm. other people. But, um, and it's so, so witty and so funny. Um, but, yeah, no, we're, we're not as funny as we think in Australia. <laughs> oh, you're pretty funny, Sal. <laughs> um, well, look, well may we say we've had an absolutely stirring and uplifting evening this evening. Men and women of Australia, maintain your rage and enthusiasm. <laughs> by please buying a copy of Well May We Say at the stall in the corner staffed by the friendly people from the Avenue Bookshop. And please acknowledge uh, the, the fantastic efforts this evening of Bert Labonte and uh, Zara Newman as well. Mm.